Rose Barker uh, asked me to do the Constitution Day lecture for like the 900th time in a row, and I agreed. Uh, and uh, and he was supposed to be here to introduce me, but he couldn't make it. He, with the president and with our other leadership, are out visiting other women's colleges to see how to preserve this one. And so uh, I've enlisted myself to uh, introduce our program and myself. Uh, so let me just say, by the way, that it's going to, uh, I'll walk you through my lecture notes, by the way, in the program, but I suppose I should introduce myself. I've known our speaker for many years. Uh, um, we've been through ups and downs, and I, I've known his best and his worst, and worse than his worst. And uh, our speaker uh, received his MA and BA from Northern Illinois University in political science in 1974 and 1977, respectively, and his PhD in government from the University of Virginia in 1986. Um, including, by the way, my fields in UVA were constitutional law, American institutions, ancient, modern, and ancient and modern political theory, and modern political thought and international relations thrown in, I guess, the salad dressing. Uh, so um, I have taught, or our speaker has taught, at uh, Dickinson College in uh, Pennsylvania, in Carleton College in Minnesota, at uh, Hampton City College in uh, Virginia, which, by the way, is the only one of two surviving all-male colleges, since one of the issues for our college is whether it should remain a single-sex institution. Besides uh, Dr. Willis, I think I'm the only person I know who's taught at an all-male and all-female institution, and I can say that in some ways I've learned that there are some differences. Um, I've also taught at Congress College. Uh, I was going to say how many years I've taught at Congress College. Let's just say my department chair, Joe Dunn, has taught here more years than I, which means we would have to resort to astronomical or geological time to describe that period. It's been 33 years, actually, this year. Uh, my colleagues are want to point out the fact that I've put on a lot of weight this year, and it's true, as I've remarked, I've noticed that my specific body mass has begun to distort the space-time continuum around me, so that light bends and that books move off the shelf when I walk by. That was actually for my department chair. And I should say, by the way, uh, that this has nothing to do with anything, but how many of you have ever seen Andy Warhol's Frankenstein? It has a great culminating scene where Frankenstein is in the, the, disturbed, the destroyed lab, Elizabeth's dead, the monster's dead, his life is ruined. He looks around and he goes, what a day. <laughs> so that's the kind of day I've had. I just thought I would remind you. Now, uh, um, here's our program if you're looking at my notes. You might see that, by the way, it begins with a musical intro. Um, and uh, since I've been doing this, or at least a large portion, um, Wendy Arms, who is uh, the uh, instructor of voice for Lawson Academy, has been providing the musical entertainment along with Del Morgan, whom I was instructed to introduce as pianist extraordinaire. <laughs> and, um, and also, by the way, who also made a request, don't shoot me, I'm just a piano player. Uh, so uh, why don't I let Wendy and Dell do the substantive part of the program, and then I'll walk you through my presentation. Wendy and Dell. Good afternoon. Welcome, everyone, to our home away from home. Um, Dr. Forty did not mention that I'm also the music librarian, so I live here. Thank you. And Dell, <laughs> and Dell is our document delivery and circulation supervisor, so he also lives here. Um, for those of you who have attended this program before, you may remember that I have performed music before, and especially pieces from the musical Hamilton. But I didn't think that my shot and the Ten Jewel Commandments would work well as a solo. So I decided to seek out some other pieces. And I had some really interesting um, topics come from friends of mine. But I decided to go with two. One from Dr. Provorty, a piece called Pistol Packin' Mama by Al Dexter, a famous by Bing My Crowley. dad's favorite song. And also one that I have always thought would be fun to sing. And you can't get a man with a gun from Andy Get Your Gun by Irving Berlin based on this story. <laughs> of Annie well. Oakley. <laughs> Pistol down, babe. Lay that pistol down. Pistol pack. 
singing and Dell was playing, there is a God uh, who picked the right songs for the right topic. Uh, I just may mention, of course, that it was Irving Berlin who wrote the last song in addition to many of the great musicals on Broadway. In addition, of course, to two of America's favorite Christian holiday songs, White Christmas and Easter Parade, which shows, shows that Jews have taught Americans how to sing. Let's see if they can teach them how to sing. Do you have your notes? I'll walk you through what I want to uh, talk about today. Uh, first, uh, I want to talk about the Constitutional Convention and why it's Constitution Day, including my favorite single quote about the Constitution from a British Prime Minister, William Gladstone, from the uh, North American Review in 1878, my single best quote. But as you're going to see, I want to use that quote to say something about the Second Amendment. Um, then. I'll try to explain why I picked this topic. I'll do that right now, but then why the title. I, very, I thought very carefully about the title. Uh, why this topic? Because the day that Provost Barker asked me to give this lecture was the day after the weekend, was the Monday after the Dayton, shoot, the, Drake, the Dayton shootings and the El Paso shootings. And this issue has been on the public mind for obvious reasons. And it 
occurred to me that perhaps when we talk about Constitution Day this year, since this issue is so much in our minds and forms so much of our partisan politics, does the Constitution have any light to shine on this? Um, now, uh, from there, I want to talk about, interestingly enough, uh, I want to go right back to the heart of our political system. For those of you in American government right now, this is uh, our discussion of the Declaration of Independence. And I want to suggest that one problem with interpreting the Second Amendment, uh, um, uh, and we'll see what the Supreme Court has done with that in a minute, one problem with interpreting the Second Amendment is it raises the question that the status of rights in our political system raises inherently. And you'll see that at the heart of our embrace of rights as the purpose of our political system is in fact a very complex, perhaps even contradictory idea. And that contradiction shows in some ways with all the rights the, uh, of the Bill of Rights, but especially the Second Amendment. Um, then I want to talk about uh, the Bill of Rights and, and raise for you two historical circumstances regarding the Bill of Rights, which uh, many people are unaware of. And one is that the drafters of the Constitution, by and large, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and James Wilson, and the other great uh, uh, founders and defenders of the Constitution during the ratification debate, opposed a Bill of Rights. Many people are unaware of that. So I want to talk about Hamilton's reasons for opposing a Bill of Rights. Uh, in Federalist 84, by the way, the Federalist Papers, number 84, which is dealt, uh, uh, devoted to this particular subject, why the Constitution had no Bill of Rights. But of course, the fact of our Constitution is we do have a Bill of Rights. So what is the meaning of the framers' opposition, and how does that uh, frame our understanding? Then, another odd dimension of that debate, and again, this is, it, it's, it's a weird topic for contemporary Americans, because the, the documents, as we know them, if you've ever visited the National Archives, in the xenon encased uh, uh, nuclear bomb proof uh, uh, display of uh, the Declaration, Constitution, and Bill of Rights, and other documents, is you know the Bill of Rights is part of the Constitution. Yet there was an interesting debate or an issue when the Bill of Rights were passed, and you'll see that was where to put them. Now that seems like such a strange and, and, and uh, um, a weird question, but you'll see it actually raises some important questions about the Bill of Rights in general and uh, the Second Amendment in particular. Uh, then we'll look at the uh, emergence, if you're looking at Roman numeral six, at the uh, at the evolution of the language of the bill of, of the Second Amendment. From now, I'm not going to go over every version of it, but I do want to at least draw your attention, as you'll see, to Madison's original draft. Remember, there's a certain irony in this amendment, as with all the Bill of Rights. Madison, as Hamilton, as you'll see, opposed the addition of a Bill of Rights. Yet, Madison was the drafter of the Bill of Rights. How could he have gone from opposing the Bill of Rights to drafting the Bill of Rights in almost the space of one year? Have you met any other politicians that have changed their minds on any subject within one year? Um, anyway, then we'll talk about where the Supreme Court has been. Uh, on the Second Amendment, and you'll see, you can divide the Supreme Court, uh, really, and, and its opinions on the Bill of Rights into two rough errors, pre-D.C., District of Columbia v. Heller in 2008, and post-D.C., uh, uh, and, and so I just want to talk briefly about what the Supreme Court seemed to say about the Second Amendment um, um, uh, uh, prior to Heller, and then why Heller was so important and the follow-up case, by the way, McDonald v. the City of Chicago in 2010. So in some ways, as you're going to see, the, the court embarked on, a, on a, a something it had never done before, which is to settle the question of what is the actual nature of the right in the Second Amendment. Uh, and then we'll examine, by the way, the contending opinions. Now, I have to say, some of you who know me as a colleague and a professor and a friend know that uh, there's a theatrical streak in my character. <laughs> Medication has helped. Um, uh, and when Professor Barker, or when Provost Barker couldn't be here, um, uh, we've discussed the Heller case, and he has a certain opinion about it. I was actually going to imitate him by taking off my nice cashmere jacket and putting on my daily one with the missing elbows and everything like that, and then I would pretend to be me, and then I'd be pre pretending to be him and present both sides of the arguments. I decided that that was probably even too much for me. So, uh, <laughs> which I think we made progress, I think. We made progress here. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, uh, we'll see where the, where the divide on the court is and how that has affected public policy, and then in conclusion, I'll state where 
I am. And as you'll see, it will help for you to have two cultural references, Fiddler on the Roof and Certs. In particular, the great question that has faced America for decades is Certs a candy mint or a breath mint? And of course, the answer is it's both. All right. So, Constitution Day. Why is this Constitution Day? Because it was the last day of the Federal Convention in 1787. The convention met from May 25th in 1787 until September 17th. And over those four long months, and one of the hottest, by the way, it's interesting that the Declaration was, de de was decided during one of the hottest summers on record in Philadelphia, as was the Constitutional Convention. One of the first uh, principles they voted on in terms of procedure was to keep the deliberations of the convention secret. Which meant, by the way, that by and large, they met with closed windows. Now, how did these guys in wool tights and everything like that sit for four months, 55 members attended, 39 pr pr primarily, with 10 pretty active ones like Hamilton and Madison, how did they do it and keep it secret? Interesting idea. But over four months, they hammered out the Constitution. And, uh, and if you don't mind, I'd like to actually add then one of my favorite uh, quotes about the Constitution uh, on the last day of the Constitution, and this is from Benjamin Franklin. So, uh, uh, so they, over the four months, they hammered it out. On September 16th, George Washington, who had been elected the president of the convention, but had never said a word. Oh, I have to say this one anecdote, uh, because it's so Washingtonisticonian. Um, uh, you know, Washington was one of the tallest uh, founders, uh, over six feet, and he was widely respected, perhaps with Franklin and with Jefferson and uh, perhaps John Adams, uh, uh, one of the truly world-renowned Americans at the time. And, and everyone was in awe of him because of his, his extremely grim and, uh, and somewhat strict uh, self-presentation. Well, remember, they had voted to keep the convention secret and its deliberation secret. Well, when they took their research on, January, uh, on July 26th to August 6th, uh, they had a menu inside. Uh, copiers make 55 copies of the Constitution. They gave them out to the members. And on August 6th, when they reconvened, evidently one of them had stuck them in his back pocket. And as he was walking up the steps to Independence Hall, the State House at that time, it fell out evidently. And unfortunately, Washington was following up behind. He didn't see who dropped it, but he walked in and convened the convention, and he said, like your gym teacher, who'd say, who did this? And everyone would step back one step. You know, he said, I, we took a solemn pledge to keep these deliberations secret. Which one of you dropped the Constitution and cleared their election of your duty? Nobody, of course, said anything. So that was the only time that Washington actually really spoke, except for September 16th, when uh, he uh, left the president's chair, came down, and made one substantive proposal, which was adopted unanimously, and that was to lower the rate of rep representation from one per 40,000 in the House of Representatives to one per 30,000. So on the 17th of September, the Constitution was brought in, the embossed version you now see in the archives to be signed. Uh, and by the way, just for, to, to start our, our discussion, three of the members, George Mason, Eldridge Jerry, and uh, I just blanked on the, the third one, refused to sign the final Constitution because it had no Bill of Rights. So on that day, this was what happened. The president, having asked what the convention uh, meant, should be done with the journals, etc., whether copies were to be allowed to the members if applied for, it was resolved, nobody contending, that quote, that he retained the journal and other papers subject to the orders of the Congress, if ever formed, under the Constitution. The members then proceeded to sign the instrument. I'm going to get a little, as they say, for Clint here, as I do when I teach this in American government. While the last members were signing it, Dr. Franklin, looking towards the president's chair, at the back of which a rising sun happened to be painted, observed to a few members near him, and just a little bit, you should know, Franklin was very close to death at this point. He was 81, I think, and had suffered for gout, like my department chair, and being overweight, etc. So we, we have living examples of that kind of suffering. So um, um, he never, in any of his speeches, he never spoke because he couldn't speak publicly. Hamilton generally read his prepared speeches. But on this day, Madison happened to overhear him whispering. And so that's the context of this paragraph. Uh, uh, Hamil, uh, Franklin uh, observed to a few members near him that painters had found it difficult to distinguish in their art 
arising from a setting sun. I have, I have said he, often in, in the course of this session, and the vicissitudes of my hopes and fears as to its issue, looked at that behind the president without being able to tell whether it was a rising or a setting sun. But now at length, I have the happiness to know that it is a rising and not a setting sun. The Constitution being signed by all the members except Mr. Randolph, Mr. Mason, and Mr. Jerry. Thank you, um, Madison, for 200 some years ago reminding me of the third name that I just forgot. Um, declined to give their sanction of their names. The convention dissolved itself by an adjournment sine die, and that means they passed the Constitution out of the Congress and to the states for the ratification struggle. That is why September 17th is Constitution Day. Now, my favorite quote on the Constitution from William Gladstone, a British Prime Minister. Uh, the American Constitution is the most wonderful work ever struck off at a given time by the brain and purpose of man. He, of course, did not have access to my dissertation, but um, <laughs> thank you for tittering. Um, but um, the reason I, I say that is because I have to agree with it. I've studied the Constitution my entire life. I spend a life teaching it, studying it, and analyzing it. And, and I would agree with Gladstone. Um, the Constitution is the foundation of the security, freedom, and prosperity of the world's most secure, free, and prosperous nation in the history of the human race. It has its problems, and so, and so does we. The Constitution, by the way, to use Madison in Federal 51, uh, if men were angels, no government would be necessary. The Constitution does not transform Americans into angels, but it is, by and large, with a couple of exceptions, prevented us from being demons. So, uh, why do I bring this quote before you? Because even though I think the Constitution as a whole follows that description, there are exceptions to its clarity and remarkable quality. I remember I submitted a paper as a freshman once uh, to an English professor in my freshman year who thought I was unusually talented, but he didn't like my paper, so he put at the bottom, even Plato nods. Um, so even the Constitution nods. There are parts of the Constitution which are remarkably clear. Like, for those of you, Alex, suffering in my American government class, what is the age or the requirements to be a member of the House of Representatives? I know you didn't expect this. No, it's called, on the spot right now. Well, how, how, how old do you have to be a member of the House? 25. 25. And what's the other requirement? You have to be representing your state. You have to live in the state you represent and be a citizen for seven years. Seven years. Very good. I still love you as a human being. So anyway, um, anyway, um, there are parts of the Constitution that are remarkably clear, and certain aspects of the Constitution, in some ways, the notes of the Convention. But for me, because I, in my own understanding of the constitutional jurisprudence, I call myself a Marshallian, which it doesn't mean I come from another planet, although you may suspect it. It means I follow the interpretive structures and strategies of Chief John Marshall, the first great Chief Mar uh, Justice of the United States. And I'll explain um, why I disagree with both Justice Stevens and Provost Barker later on, and what that interpretive strategy is. I'm not so much an originalist as Scalia, may he rest in peace, used to describe himself, and as Gorsuch and Trump's uh, appointees describe themselves, which, by the way, seems to be the regnant approach uh, of the five-person so-called conservative majority on the court today. Um, but I'm an original principalist as embodied in the structure and text of the document. I'll try to, I'll try to make it clear what that means in terms of interpreting the difficult and ambiguous language. So here's my point. Even though the Constitution is this remarkable document, parts of it are extremely vague and difficult to understand because of ambiguous language, cruel and unusual punishments, reasonable searches and seizures, uh, warrants issuing on probable cause, the privileges and immunities of the citizens of the several states. Um, some parts of the Constitution are very difficult, and I'm going to argue that the Second Amendment does possess a certain ambiguity. And, and like other parts of the Constitution that are ambiguous, I think it's because the drafters of the Bill of Rights, and the Second Amendment in particular, were trying to combine in concise language several difficult and different ideas. So uh, in some ways, the more concepts you try to pack into compact prose, the more likely, actually, you're likely to produce an ambiguous result. And I think that is to some degree true of the Second Amendment. So. Um, uh, now, a little comment on judicial review, uh, not only because this is interesting and we're talking about the Constitution, but 
uh, but it explains in some ways my title. Originally, I was going to call this a re the Second Amendment a reasonable approach. But as you're going to see, I decided I wanted to make it more modest, believe it or not. And to understand that modesty and the particular confinement of what I want to talk about today, it's interesting to see uh, 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 how the concept of judicial review, the idea that the judges measure the constitutionality of the actions of the other branches and of the people to some degree by a constitutional standard. Uh, now this idea comes from one of the great constitutional scholars uh, uh, of American history, Edward S. Corrin, in his very uh, pungent but very trenchant uh, little treatise, The Higher Law Background of American uh, Constitutional Law. In this little treatise, Corwin is trying to explain something. Why did the English, why did the British Constitution try for centuries to produce a stand, a constitutional standard for limiting the excesses of Crown and Parliament, but never fully succeeding? And why did the Americans, because this is his thesis, that the Americans for the first time in human history created a genuine standard for limiting the uh, institutions of government and a mechanism for enforcing those limits. And of course, that's the written constitution. We'll come, this is the conclusion, the written constitution and judicial review. So why couldn't the British Constitution do this? Because what does the British Constitution not have? A written constitution. Yes, it has primary documents like Magna Carta and the Reform Act of 1832 or the Reform Act of 1911. But those are acts of parliament. And in some ways, the question within the British Constitution was veering between uh, royal supremacy versus uh, parliamentary supremacy. So in some ways, uh, as he goes through Coke, Fortescue, and Blackstone, he shows that the British judiciary tried to create some standard and some mechanism for limiting the operations of government. But it was only with the American written constitution. And when I teach this in American government, I, I, I suggest, by the way, that this habit, this American habit, which is now imitated by almost all the political entities in the world, that is to say, written constitution, probably comes from our first genuine American document, the Mayflower Compact. That what the Puritans did when they, when they landed, actually they did this a little bit before they landed, and uh, since you've had enough singing today, at this point in my American government classes, I sing Anything Goes because of this wonderful pro preface. Uh, times have changed, and we've often rewound the clock. Since the Puritans got a shock when they landed on Plymouth Rock, but today, any uh, shock they would try to stem, any, uh, any shock they would try to stem, Plymouth Rock would land on them. There, now you know. I didn't sing it. At least I respected your dignity. So, um, um, so the Mayflower Compact. Here you had on these shores the first political entity established by colonists, and what did they try to do? They tried to put it in a written document. I think actually that's where our tradition of written constitution comes from. So, what's interesting is, by the way, how little debated this theory was in the convention. It's almost unmentioned. And uh, if you look at your notes, you're going to get the only real mention or discussion of this power on June 4th, 1787, Monday. Now, let me give you a little context. Madison had written the first great proposal in the convention, the Virginia Plan, and in it, he proposed a institution for limiting Congress, or the legislative branch, and that was called a Council of Revision. Some of the states had something like this. And the idea was the president and several members of the judiciary, probably the Supreme Court, would form a new institution that would review every piece of legislation passed by Congress. On the grounds of the great defect in the state constitution, during the 11-year crisis period between the Declaration and the Constitution was that the state legislatures generally disobeyed or ignored their state constitutions. So, uh, uh, it turns out, by the way, the convention rejected this idea. And how does it survive? It survives in one aspect in the qualified veto of the president. So the president is, and they came to understand this, that the president would be the primary external institutional check on excesses within the legislative branch. But what about the judiciary? And this is Elbridge Gerry. Uh, uh, and this is almost the only statement on judicial review. But the reason I lay it in front of you is, as you'll see, it explains the choice of my topic and what I'll be talking about. Mr. Jerry doubts whether the judiciary ought to form a part of it, that is to say the Council of Revision. 
as they will have a sufficient check against encroachments on their own department by their exposition, that is to say interpretation, of the laws, which involved a uh, power of deciding on their constitutionality. In some states, the judge had actually set aside laws being against the Constitution. This was done, too, with general approbation. It was quite foreign from the nature of the office to make the judge, them judges, the judges, that is, of policy and public measures. He moves to postpone that, and then, and then by the way, moved to uh, put a veto. What do you learn from this? First of all, that it almost went unassumed and unexplained, although, uh, again, it's hard to say how many framers at this point thought the judges should have this power. Um, but in this first discussion of it, he argues, yes, they should have the power to decide constitutionality, but not policy, not the, not the good or bad policy of an aspect. So what I'm going to argue, by the way, is that in some ways, although very rapidly, within Federal uh, 78, where Hamilton, a couple of months after the convention, actually produces full-blown, as his brilliant mind often did, a full-blown theory of judicial review that uh, uh, Chief Justice Marshall employed in Marbury v. Madison uh, in 1803. So this power of judges to review the constitutionality of policy of the other branches is, in fact, an important part of our system, and it's amazing how quickly that congealed. But here's the point. Following uh, Jerry, in some ways, we don't want the judges to judge, we don't want them to be policy makers. This is a complicated question of American judiciary and constitutional law, but you'd have to say this. We, their particular expertise is knowing and understanding the law, not what makes good policy. And that distinction between the constitutionality of a policy and the wisdom of a policy is what guided my topic. I deliberately chose the Second Amendment and the Constitution to uh, limit myself to the question of what is the constitutional context and understanding of the Second Amendment, not what would constitute wise gun policy under the Second Amendment. That's the task of government, by the way. So, remember, a constitutional policy may be a good policy, may be a bad policy. Conversely, and we might as well use that term, a, uh, a, a good policy may be an unconstitutional policy. Uh, so I'm only going to talk about what the Constitution suggests about what's permitted under the Second Amendment. Now, um, uh, not what should actually be done. Now, uh, there's, there's uh, one other dimension of that, by the way, and that also comes from the Federalist Papers. What should guide us in understanding uh, the, uh, the, the meaning of good public policy? And, uh, and for that, by the way, I think Hamilton is also useful. If you look on your notes, it's, um, it's the second quote, which I'm now quoting out of order, by the way. But if you, uh, uh, if you look down the Federal 71, this is an important quote. Do you see where it says Federal 71, the deliberate sense of the community? There are some who would be inclined to regard the servile pliancy of the executive to a prevailing current, either in the community or in the legislature, as its best recommendation. But such men entertain very crude notions, as well of the purposes to which government was instituted as of the true means by which the public happiness may be promoted. The Republican principle, bearing in mind that what we have is a constitutional republic and not a democracy, the Republican principle demands that the deliberate sense of the community, the controlling term in this passage, should govern the conduct of those to whom they entrust the management of their affairs. But it does not require an unqualified complacence to every sudden breeze of passion or to every transient impulse which the people may receive from the arts of men who flatter their prejudices to betray their interests. It is a just observation that the people commonly intend the public good. Uh, this often applies to their very errors. But their good sense would despise the adulator, and then I have to explain to my students that adulator is not the thing inside your washing machine. An adulator is somebody who praises the public so as to get their support. A demagogue. Uh, uh, who should pretend that they always reason right about the means of promoting it. So the critical thing is, as you'll see, when it comes to what's wise policy under the Constitution vis-a-vis -vis guns or any other issue, is the deliberate sense of the community, not the panicked sense of the community. All right, uh, so further by way of introduction to this issue, the contradictory and complex dynamic of rights in our political system. I'm gonna argue that in our notion of rights without which our, our political system wouldn't exist, as Abraham Lincoln said, the Declaration is the apple uh, to the silver frame of the Constitution. It's the purpose of art to secure rights, but you have to see there's a real tension and a problem there. 
Here's the second paragraph of the Declaration. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among which are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Here's the contradiction. We create government to preserve our rights, our freedoms. Yet, in order to create government, we have to give up some of our freedom in order to preserve our freedom. Can you not hear the tension, the contradiction in that? What, as I ask, is the next logical question? How much freedom do you need to give up to preserve your freedom? There is no easy answer to that. The Declaration doesn't answer that. That's the task of government and the deliberate sense of the community. What does it depend on? First of all, it depends on circumstances. What government does during and after a natural disaster is different from what government does on a noonday afternoon in front of G Hall, where students are being subjected to the food that Congress serves them as food, which itself is a kind of emergency. I thought that I'd throw that into the school. All right, so, so the problem is this. Uh, how do you, where's the limit, where's the set point? where you get the right balance of the deliberate sense of community expressing the common good versus the right that you're trying to preserve. How much freedom do you need to give up to preserve freedom? It's a difficult question. The Declaration doesn't answer it, but it points to an answer in terms of ends and means. The end is preserving our freedom. The means is government within the common good of society. So strictly speaking, here is a kind of a guiding principle from the Declaration, which you'll see applies to the Bill of Rights in general and the Second Amendment in particular. Our aim is to restrict that right for the common good and the necessity of the public good and public safety, preserving as much of that original right as possible. Since the preservation of the right is the end, government is the means and the restriction is the means, that's the principle. The aim is to preserve as much of that right, whether it's speech, press, religion, or arms, in society as is consistent with living with the common good. That is, I think, what the Declaration would suggest. And as you're going to see, I think that's implicit in the Bill of Rights. Now, uh, uh, what about the controversy of the Bill of Rights? What was the great controversy? Uh, why did the framers reject the idea of a Bill of Rights? Uh, Essentially, I'm going to be uh, 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 quoting from Hamilton's discussion of this in Federalist 84. He argued a Bill of Rights was unnecessary, dangerous, and uh, useless. What does he mean by that? Why unnecessary? The argument the framers made was the Constitution, because of separation of powers, checks and balance, federalism creates this complex system of government grounded in popular authority. A Bill of Rights comes from the Britain Constitution, where it was a limit on royal authority in the name of the people. But here, the people create the government. Here, the government is structured in terms of federalism, enumerated powers, checks and balances. The, and, and by the way, the, the, the phrase that Hamilton uses here is the one the framers generally use. The Constitution is a Bill of Rights. That is to say, in its structure and operation, it produces the limits on government that people wanted from a Bill of Rights. Now, there are all kinds of interesting answers to that. Yes, the national government has enumerated powers, but aren't those powers read very flexibly? And might there not be implied powers that might destroy invested rights? So in some ways, there was a certain naivete to that argument. What about the dangerous part? Why would a Bill of Rights be dangerous? Hamilton says, listing fundamental rights might make you think that that's all the rights you have. And so in some ways, by the way, that actually was embodied, that, that concern was embodied in First Madison's original draft of the Bill of Rights and the final one in the Ninth Amendment. The enumeration of certain rights in this Constitution shall not be understood to deny or disparage others retained by the people. So, now, what about the useless one? In, in a way, Hamilton's asking, what do, what do bills of rights do? They list rights. They don't define rights. And the difficult thing with rights is how do you define their civil meaning and application. So in some ways, he thought there was a simple-mindedness to bills of rights, which would make people think that just because you listed them, you defined them. That is not the case. It has never been the case. And I would say on the Second Amendment, it has led to remarkable extremes of thought, where people really leap to extremes in terms of what kinds of guns they have and what kinds of guns they want to protect, and in terms of what kinds of guns they think you can take people people th think you can take away from them. In other words, the problem is they, the rights have to be defined. And as you're going to see, I think within the context and language of the Bill of Rights, there is a kind of moderation present. Now, um, what about the other question? The strange question, where to put the Bill of Rights? There were three possibilities. Generally speaking, the anti-federalists wanted the Bill of Rights to be at the front of the Constitution as a preamble to the preamble. Why? So that you would remind 
the government and the people that what this business is is about securing those rights. So to secure them, you list them. The framers rejected that. And our, thank God, by the way, our preamble remains pretty simple and clear. We the people in order to form a more perfect union. Um, the other alternative, as you'll see, was to put them at the end, which is where it happened. Madison did not want that. What did Madison want? Like, by the way, the constitution of the faculty at Congress College, whenever we amend the faculty constitution, we actually amend the original document. So Madison wanted the Bill of Rights, the amendments, the First Ten Amendments, to actually go in the text of the Constitution. So, uh, why did he want that? One, because he thought that people should be aware of the fact that listing your rights doesn't secure them, that having a well-constructed constitutional government does. What better way to show by putting the Bill of Rights into the structure of the Constitution? Does that make sense? So, but then the next question is, where would they have gone in the original Constitution? Where would the Bill of Rights have belonged if they had gone in the original uh, language of the Constitution? And here's the answer. Article 1, Section 9. Article 1 sets up Congress. Uh, the first uh, sections define Congress, set up the House and Senate, give its powers, procedure for how a bill becomes a law. Section 8 says the 18 different powers that Congress has, in other words, what Congress can do. So what does Section 9 say? What Congress can't do. And Section 10 conversely uh, states that um, uh, that what the states can't do. So, when you turn to Article 1, Section 9, what kind of limitations do you find there? You find that there are three kinds of limits placed on Congress. One, limits placed on Congress's power in the name of individual liberties, such as no ex post facto law, no bill of attainder, uh, no tax or capitation tax. Um, uh, so that's one kind. Limitations placed on Congress's uh, uh, power in the name of securing individual liberty. A second kind is limitations placed on Congress's power for the purposes of preserving the state's authority, like the infamous Migration and Importation Clause, the Slave Trade Clause. No, Congress may pass no law uh, uh, restricting uh, the importation or migrations of such persons as existing states think. Uh, of course, that means uh, that Congress couldn't pass a law taking away the slave trade until 20 years after the Constitution, which is what it did, this first act in 1808. So, and other things like no tax which prejudices, which prejudices one state over another. The third kind of limitation is a limitation placed on Congress's power in the name of good government or Republican government. No titles of nobility, uh, 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 no royalty, that kind of thing. So, the question obviously is, where does the Second Amendment live in there? What kind of a limitation on Congress's power is the Second Amendment? My answer, as you will be, will be a combination of Fifth on the Roof and Sturts. So, what about the language of the First Amendment? Look at Madison's original draft. Here it is. The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. A well-armed and well-regulated militia being the best security of a free country, but no person religiously scrupulous of bearing arms shall be compelled to render military service in person. Madison seems to have three ideas in mind. One, uh, the people have the right to bear arms. Two, uh, uh, a militia is necessary for a free state, and therefore states should be allowed to organize their public militias. And three, what we today call conscientious objection. Now you're going to see that, generally speaking, Madison, who was a brilliant guy, was a little wordy at times, perhaps because he was so short. He was five feet four inches tall, the only representative hobbit among our founders. Um, so in some ways, you'll notice that the Bill of Rights gets more economical in language as it moves to its draft, to its final draft, and there it is at the bottom. You can look at the other drafts on your own leisure. Uh, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. So, what is the nature of the limitation? Is it a personal right? Is it a state's right? Is it a general restriction in terms of good government? The primary debate, as you're going to see, is, is the Second Amendment a personal right or liberty, or is it a restriction on Congress's power in favor of the states? Is it a state power right or an individual right? And that is clearly the question. What has the Supreme Court said pre 
Keller. It actually never really fully spoke to the nature of the fundamental right. In the three primary cases that formed stare decisis for Heller in 2008, the court essentially said in two cases, Crickshank and Presser, that both states and the national government could restrict other military organizations and could establish the official one. Because what are we talking about right after the Civil War? Uh, Crickshank, 1876, and Presser, 1886. We're talking about what interesting quasi-military organization rose up in the South. Well, this is after the Civil War. The K, K, K. And so in some ways, in these two, what the court was speaking to was, could the state exclude militia to officially recognize militia, or, and could it therefore prohibit, as it did in Illinois with a state law, or could Congress prohibit the forming of other non-official militias? And the court said yes. But you understand, it didn't actually raise the question of what the fundamental right is. In U.S. v. Miller, in the 30s, it upheld a congressional statute that made it illegal to transport sawed-off shotguns across state lines. So it was both an extension of Congress's commerce power and the Second Amendment. What the court held was uh, that the Congress did have the authority to restrict certain kinds of weapons on the grounds that what the the Second Amendment does is establish a standard that the kinds of weapons that people are allowed to have are those which are commonly used in a militia. And that therefore the Congress could reasonably decide that sawed off shotguns, 18 inch shotguns, uh, were not necessarily militia type weapons. But again, in none of its precedent cases does it come to the question of what the actual nature of the right is. That is what it does in D.C., District of Columbia v. Heller. The District of Columbia had a, uh, two restrictions. One, you couldn't own a handgun without being registered, and two, uh, uh, and then almost then made it impossible to register, and two, if you did have a registered handgun in your home, you had to have a trigger lock on it, and you had to have it unloaded, and therefore it was unusable. So in some ways, the D.C. regulation both prohibited the personal ownership of handgun, as did, by the way, the law in Chicago, as you'll see, uh, in 2010, and then if you did own one, made it almost impossible to make it usable. Does that make sense? So what did the court hold? There was a majority and two dissents. So what did the majority, that is to say Scalia, and Roberts, Kennedy, Thomas, and Alito, the Second Amendment is an individual right uh, to means of self-defense. That's the core right. Strictly speaking, then, the first clause, uh, the security of a free, free people being dependent on militia, is adjectival. Uh, as you'll see, uh, uh, the court held that even though there's a principle there, it suggests one of the potential uses that the right to bear arms may have, but the critical thing is, the court, and Scalia, and those who joined him said, it's not restricted to that. That underneath it all is a personal right of self-defense. The dissenters, uh, primarily uh, Justice Stevens with Breyer, Souter, and Ginsburg, uh, argued that the Second Amendment is essentially a state right to form publicly equipped popular militia bodies, not an individual right to self-defense. This is the way that I try to explain to myself and therefore to you. In a way, the minority holds that the individual's right to bear arms is a legislative grace in the same way that certain privileges like the right to drive on the state level is. You don't have a constitutional right to drive. That is a legislative constructed privilege, which is then for limited as the legislator sees fit. Or something like conscientious objection. People think, for instance, that they have a constitutional right to be a conscientious objector. Consci I'm slurring here, excuse me. Um, a, a conscient they don't. The Constitution doesn't grant you the right to do, not to serve in the military. The Congress has created categories of legislative grace allowing you to make those claims. But who created that privilege of conscientious objection? Congress, and therefore Congress can withdraw it or limit it. That is, I think, how the debate shaped up on the court. Uh, Breyer added, and in his defense, by the way, in his additional dissent, the argument that D.C.'s regulation was not unreasonable if you use what's called the court called an interest balancing test. Now, I'm going to be to br briefly talk about, on Roman numeral 9, the next major step, which is a couple of years later. Now, for that, I'm just going to tell you about, without explaining, probably the single most important doctrine, constitutional doctrine on the Supreme Court in the last 200 plus years. And that is because of the major change made to the United States Constitution by the addition of the 14th Amendment after the Civil War, which says, 
all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof are citizens of the United States and of the state wherein they resolve. No state shall, adopt, shall deny or abridge the privileges or immunities of a citizen of the United States, nor deny to any person uh, the due process, nor deny any person uh, life, or take any personal life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within their jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. <laughs> Over the years, the court has held that those three clauses, and particularly the due process clause, have incorporated the Bill of Rights into the 14th Amendment. So although the original Bill of Rights only restricted the federal government, and as Marshall held in Barron v. Baltimore in 1833, the Bill of Rights does not restrict state governments. But with the passage of the, of the 14th Amendment, the court has gradually held that more and more of the Bill of Rights is incorporated into the 14th Amendment and therefore also restricts the state. Now, the court, there was only one voice in the entire history of the court who said, the Bill of Rights equals the 14th Amendment, Justice Black. The court has never fully endowed. Instead, the court's doctrine has been selective incorporation. The 14th Amendment doesn't make all of the Bill of Rights applicable to states, only the fundamental ones. Now, if you've had a third grade education, what's the next logical question? Which of those 34 rights are fundamental, so fundamental, and which are not? This has been the major debate within the court, but you have to say this that by the 1970s, 80s, almost all of the rights in the Bill of Rights were now understood to be applied against the state, with a few exceptions, like the 17th Amendment, the Seventh Amendment's uh, $20 requirement for a federal suit, uh, and the Second Amendment, and the Third Amendment, quartering of troops. Why not quartering of troops? Because that seems to have been the only uncontroversial amendment in the whole uh, business. Uh, so it says it in the Declaration, don't put soldiers in our homes, the Third Amendment says it, and, and the government seems to have said, we got it. Uh, but what about the Second Amendment? After Heller, in which the court decided there was an individual liberty, in McDonald's v. Chicago in 2010, the court incorporated the Second Amendment's personal right to bear arms into the 14th Amendment. With um, uh, Alito, joined by Roberts, Kennedy, Scalia, and Thomas, the 14th Amendment incorporates the Second Amendment against the states as a fundamental individual right through the Due Process Clause. And Stevens, echoing his dissent in uh, 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 Heller, arguing that there is no little, there, since there is no individual liberty interest, no individual right, it's not incorporated, essentially. Or if it was, it's not fundamental. So, um, what is the Povordian conclusion to this issue? Um, you know, in Spill Around the World, when Tavia says to the one guy, you're right, with the guy he's arguing with, and then he turns to the other guy and says, you're right, and that third guy says to Tevye, they both can't be right, and Tevye turns to them and says, you're right, too. I actually think both uh, the majority and the minority opinions are right. Uh, and like certs, which is both a breath and a candy mint, I'm going to argue that the second the amendment is both a state power and an individual right. Where do I get the authority to say that? Where am I pulling that? Since, by the way, in Heller, both the majority and minority opinions, the dissents and the majority opinion, provide an extensive history, which are both interesting and claim that the second amendment only meant a militia state right, not an individual right, whereas Scalia disagrees with that. I'm not wiping the history aside. I think you do have to look at the history, in some ways, of the language of the time. But I do think, actually, the history is interesting, inconclusive, and in some ways supports both interpretations. Where am I getting my uh, authority? And I'm going to argue from the structure and text of the Constitution, of course. Last page here. Um, you should be hearing the music for Jeopardy right now. Um, so, but in my opinion, the Second Amendment is both a state power, guaranteed congressional power, and an individual right. Where do I get this? From the language and structure of the Constitution. What supports the idea that the, for, the Second Amendment is primarily limited on Congress in favor of state power to organize a militia? The Establishment Clause. Of all the 34 rights in the Bill of Rights, the only clause that is clearly not necessarily an individual right, even though some courts have now interpreted the non-establishment clause, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or protecting the free exercise thereof. There's no question that the free exercise clause is an individual right. You can choose whatever religion you want, right? The question is, what is the establishment clause? And most history of the Bill of Rights suggests that was put in not only so that the national government couldn't establish a church, 
one of the three kinds of limitations in Article 1, Section 9, but to prevent the Congress from interfering with the state-established religions of which six states had established religions at the time of the Bill of Rights. So, in some ways, you can look at that and say, whoa, the Second Amendment is like that, uh, because it protects the states to form, right to form a militia. Does that make sense? What supports the idea that the Constitution, that there's an individual right? And I would argue both the, the overall nature, structure of the Bill of Rights as a separate part of the Constitution, uh, and the language. What do I mean by that? There are 34 individual liberties and rights listed in the eight rights of the Bill of Rights, excluding the Ninth Amendment and the Tenth Amendment. Almost all of those are individual liberties, with the exception, potentially, of the Establishment Clause. So I would argue that given the context of the Second Amendment, it is speaking about an individual liberty. Moreover, as a Marshallian, I would add this argument. Marshall argued, if you want to understand a difficult term in one part of a document, you look to the way it's been used in another part of the document. And so what is the critical language? The right of the people to keep in their arms. In two other places in the Bill of Rights, the Constitution uses the language, the right of the people. The right of the people peaceably to assemble in the First Amendment, and the right of the people to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures in their homes and personal effects in the Fourth Amendment. What is referred to when it says the right of the people? An individual liberty. Therefore, I would argue that the framers, in some ways, intended there to be, as Scalia and the majority argued, a fundamental individual liberty to self-protection, which can be contextualized in a militia, but does not necessarily have to be. Now, uh, how can possibly it be both? Look at the Tenth Amendment. The Tenth Amendment says... Uh, the powers not delegated to the United States shall be reserved to the states and the people. So can something be both a limitation on Congress's power with respect to a state power and an individual liberty? I think the Ten Amendment suggests, and therefore that is my argument. I support the majority's opinion that the, for, that the Second Amendment is an individual right to bear arms, and nevertheless that it also protects the state right to organize and equip a militia. Having said that, the two parts of the Supreme Court are not so far as apart as you think, because they actually agree on what? To go back to my original argument that the Declaration says we enjoy our rights but under the context of limitations for the common good. If there is a personal liberty in the Second Amendment, nevertheless, our task is to preserve the individual right under reasonable restriction for the common safety of society formulated by the deliberate sense of the community. You can clap now. <laughs> I probably went on about 10 minutes longer, but uh, are there any comments or questions? Uh, I know, uh, as last year, when you threw me for a loop because when I talked about impeachment, you asked a question based on the one area of cosmological knowledge of which I have no intuitive, historical, or personal grasp, sports <laughs> analogies. Would you like to try it again? Without the sports. Try me. I have, I have support here. If your premise is correct, which I tend to think it is, there's nobody in Washington smart enough to make a decision. That may be a separate problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, if it's the deliberate sense of the community through our representative institutions, but what if both sides of our political spectrum are intent on demagoguing? And, uh, and arousing public sentiment without genuine reflection or compromise. Well, then we're probably up at Blank Creek. See my self-censorship without a paddle. So I have to say, this points to a larger problem in our representative institutions right now. I'm a student of American politics. I love the Constitution and the system it engenders. I think we are in deep trouble in terms of the extremes of our political system right now. And I'm not pointing fingers at anybody right now, but both sides of the political spectrum and the individual sitting in the center of it have not helped our political dialogue in this country. So in some ways, given the horrors that have been unleashed under the use of certain weapons in certain contexts, uh, I would say the framers would have thought that you could have reasonable restrictions on the right to bear arms within, consistent with the public safety. It shouldn't be based in panic. It should be based on things that really do make the public safety. Do either side of the political spectrum seem interested in raising this question or doing right now? I have to say, you're probably right about that. My argument is 
The Second Amendment permits reasonable restriction on this right in the name of public safety. So what our, what our representative uh, uh, should be doing is formulating what means would actually increase uh, the safety of the public, especially in these circumstances like mass shootings, etc. But don't forget, um, mass shootings are only one small proportion of the uh, shootings that go on every day. So in some ways, there would be still a difficulty. And here's another fact in, in doing the research for this talk. 43% of American households own a gun. A substantial portion of Americans believe or agree with the Supreme Court that there's a personal right. Yet, the substantial portion of that 43% also believes that certain kinds of weapons are inappropriate for ownership and there can be certain other reasonable limitations such as the vast majority of Americans actually, even gun owners, support universal registration. But we're, we're close to that anyway. But I think that would be a kind of an example, possibly, of reasonable uh, uh, legislation. But speed limits seem so simple. <laughs> Not for me. <laughs> I thought that 85 on, on, on that highway out there from Charlotte was actually the speed limit. That argument doesn't work with policemen. Yeah, exactly. But, oh, by the way, but you point the fact, if we had no limits, if we had no highway laws, we wouldn't be really able to enjoy the freedom to drive on the highway. It's the restriction, the reasonable restriction of rights that enable us to enjoy rights. So in some ways, I, I agree with your analogy. Aren't speed limits the kind of proper analogy. Yes, I think that's true. Now, what would that look like specifically with respect to the kinds of weapons that Americans own and use uh, and, and other kinds of restrictions like, like universal uh, checks or some of the issues like red flag laws that are being dis discussed? I mean, for that, you have to get to the question of how what actually produces these mass shootings. Um, and there's, there are complex cultural answers to that, complex. Um, I just read a trenchant article by one of the fathers of one of the students shot, shot in the Parkland shootings who argued that everything that needed to prevent that shooting was in place. Uh, but instead there was a bad school policy which looked away from the tendency of that individual and actually allowed him not only to get the guns, that was the sheriff's department's and the FBI's mistake because evidently there were, I think, 17 separate flags over three years about that individual. And the policy of not putting on permanent records students or expelling students so in other words, that student was allowed to buy weapons and come to school. So I'm not taking a side on that, but I have to say it's a trenchant article. So again, what constitutes a reasonable restriction on that personal right if you grant there's a personal right? For that, you have to ask, what's the nature of the problem plaguing our country? What causes or makes it permissible the mass shootings? Are there more things we could put in place which would not deny people their essential right to own, keep and bear an arm, and at the same time protect the public from misuse of those arms or from the use of certain kinds of arms? I think there is an answer to that question. But the question is where? Is the or the question may be whom, by whom. Um, look, if I could sit uh, Mitch McConnell and Nancy Pelosi and uh, Donald Trump down in the family restroom where we could all meet with a locked door, I try to get them to agree on something that they could benefit all. But again, our partisanship of our system is so intense right now that I think there are people in Congress and in the executive branch who will deny a proper solution to these problems simply because it denies a partisan advantage to their opponents or accrues a partisan advantage to them. Now, that has nothing to do with the Second Amendment or any of the other Bill of Rights. It has to do with our political culture right now, which I think is in peril. Okay. Was that a, was that a shut up sign? Oh yeah. Or was that a question? Okay. Uh, you then then that strange bald heavy set man in the back. <laughs> Go ahead, JD. Oh. Um, do you think that uh, our uh, political climate is, is a reflection of our media, or is our media a reflection of our political? Climate? Yes and yes. There, are, there. Why is our why is our political culture? drifted to such extremes, both socially and institutionally. The framers clearly helped to create a, helped to create a constitutional system which would frustrate that through representative institutions, separation of powers, etc. There is an institutional question. So part of it, I think it is, is the, the distortion in our media. We talk about the press 
but the press is not simply this disembodied uh, uh, institution that has, doesn't have its own self-interest and, and pathologies, it does. And with respect to our president, there's no question that the pathologies of the press feed upon the, the elements of our president's character. They feed each other. But this also preceded Trump, by the way. So I would say that to some degree, the complete partisanization of the media goes perhaps back about 30 to 40 years with the, um, with the rise of cable television in which no longer did you have overarching uh, television networks that covered the whole spectrum, but now you had niche, niche, am I saying that right? I born this country, uh, niche, niche, uh, uh, which has been increased and radicalized by the tendencies of the internet and social media. So, if you, depending on how broadly you define media, yes, it's partially our culture, partially the media, they feed on both, and institutionally, this is kind of what I've talked about the last couple of times in this venue. I think the greatest threat to our constitutional system institutionally is the complete democratization of our presidential nominating system. And this goes back about 40 years. With, with, the, with the reforms, our party reforms have done in the last 40 years is essentially restrain and remove all institutional restraints and inputs based on anything other than popular following. Uh, now, when the Democrats first reformed the nominating system in 1968 and the Republicans followed, it wasn't too long between, by the 70s, you had now each of the 50 states having binding primary or caucuses. But that meant within five years of our prior system, which was a moderate system based upon party leadership and uh, primaries, we have a system in which every phase of the nomination and election is now determined by popular following. With what result? It turns out that in primary elections, only about 20 to 30 percent of the electorate participates. And what kind? The most extreme ideologically. So in some ways, our nomination process, both on the presidential level and on the congressional level and on the local level, has encouraged two dangerous tendencies. The elimination within the occupants of our representative institutions of moderates. So that whereas in the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, there were liberal Republicans and conservative Democrats, now our two parties have become far more extreme ideologically, primarily because of the nomination stage. Second, in requiring now popular followings as the primary qualification for candidates, you have completely dissolved any institutional restraint on that. The Democrats who initially reformed our system in the 60s and 70s never anticipated that their system would produce a Donald Trump. Never anticipated that it would produce a nominating system with 19 Republicans on the stage in 2016 and 23 Democrats on the stage in 2020. So in some ways, uh, I would say, in addition to the media question, which is complex and related to tendencies in our culture, uh, and with the internet and public, uh, 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 and um, what's it called when you go to Facebook? Social media. Social media, thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, there have been institutional tendencies which have created the inability of our representative institutions to find reasonable compromises. Dr. Dunn. Uh, just in case you should retire, you've got a list today, uh, and run for public office. Let's put you on the record for a public office when you run. Uh, and assuming that all solutions don't have to include all uh, the of all issues, um, are there specific restrictions upon uh, gun control that you would advocate? And I would suggest two, and you may either agree or disagree, and, and add two. I would say I find no public purpose uh, that could justify mega clips of over 100 rounds of, of ammunition, which would solve, it wouldn't solve all the problems of the world of mass shooting, but it would, in a mass shooting, it would limit the ability of the shooter to mass carnage. And one, that uh, the justification of uh, combat assault weapons totally created, manufactured with one purpose and one purpose alone, to kill and maim. They are not for target shooting. They're not. So would you support, that would not solve all, would you support publicly those two things? Are there any others that you would, you would support? First of all, all weapons are intended to kill and maim. 
but some more, some, some more. Yes, I don't think that people should allow be allowed to buy nuclear weapons, except if it's a Jewish community. <laughs> uh, now, look, I understand the question you're asking. And, and so the point of my lecture was to say that what kind of... I want the point of your lecture. I want the point of your personal statement. Maybe I'm not wise enough uh, that we to propose uh, an adequate policy. I, if I were in office or running for office, how would I respond to your question? I'd start with all of the existing regulations we do have in place, which, if enforced, what that would lead to, because many of the situations that have led to mass shootings have been where existing regulations were not applied, where uh, uh, where uh, individuals got hold of uh, weapons who shouldn't have had them. We're, and we there is some interesting debate going on in those areas right now. Or registration. I'm not opposed to uni universal registration. I think the Second Amendment would permit that. Um, but we're, we're close to that now anyway. But by the way, I also would, I think that it's within Congress's commerce power. I'm often considered a conservative, but I have a very expansive notion of Congress's commerce power because I was very influenced by a, uh, one of my professors, Herbert Thorn, who was influenced by William Krosky, whose three-volume great history of the Commerce Clause persuaded me that what the Commerce Clause granted to Congress was the power to regulate every commercial transaction within the United States. That's very controversial. But could Congress put a national ban on the private sales of... Uh, um, assault weapons, however one defines those. Yes, I think so. I think that is, and we should debate that. So in some ways, uh, I would say this, that again, you'd have to start on this question with the regulations we have, then specifically look at the situations we're trying to prevent. Now, one situation that would be difficult, although we actually tried to, a legislative fix for the guy in Las Vegas uh, who shot the 61 people. They did, in fact, prohibit bump stock. Edition. So there is a legislative fix, which probably did address one potential cause. Now, your question seems to be, is it a reasonable or permissible restriction under the Second Amendment to restrict the kinds of weapons that people may own and say the stock of ammunition? Yes, I think the Second Amendment would permit those regulations. Whether or not those are the answer to our problems or whether or not those are reasonable, that's what our representatives uh, have to debate. I can see the argument for some of those things, but you understand what the purpose is. And you are avoiding the question I asked? I'm not avoiding the question. I ask for your, as a, as a political figure with the power to make legislative policy, your vote on the issue, let's take the simplest one, on your vote to restrict. The amount of ammunition you can have. So yes, you, I, mean, I, I agree with you. There, the first thing I would vote on, this. if I were a member of Congress or president, would be a uh, a, a required uh, retirement limit for department chairs. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think age 90 is a very good age for the <laughs> Congratulations, and Mazel Tov. Would you answer my question? <laughs> so, by the way, would I vote for those? Yes, I'm not asking question, a question yes by saying no. I have to think it through and look at the specific proposal. You've never thought anything through before. That's what the deliberate. <laughs> that's what the deliberate sense of the community is. I actually have a question about the Second Amendment. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> please. Um, so the question that I have that has you you touched on, but I'd like explained in a little bit more detail. So in all the different versions of these drafts, the, the part that stuck, that stayed, is the, a well-regulated militia being the best security in the free state. And so then we have the decision in 2008 that this clause is adjectival, Correct. but not restrictive of the individual right. Could you explain more about the rationale for why is that not all considered together? Why is that just one part of the explanation of it when that was always part of the, the configuration of how they thought about Because the language of the Second Amendment, if I understand your question, um, why, how did the court come to the conclusion of these two parts of the Second Amendment, that one was nominative or yes. substantive and one was adjectival? Mm -hmm. And in some ways, that's the difference on the court. Uh, the, the minority seems to suggest that the substantive right is the first clause, mm -hmm. and therefore the second clause is either surplusage or or uh, comment, comment on the first. Uh, my first response was, I think the drafting of the Second Amendment was defective, and that in some ways the final language, which was understood to be economical and even eloquent in scope, 
combined uh, several conflicting or not identical ideas. The protection of the state power to form and equip a militia and this larger individual right of self-defense. Now, where do I get that, that the framers, and by the way, when you read this, and you should, you should all read Heller, because in some ways, as I suggested to Provost Parker, it's the court at its best. You, you see them arguing as historians, as textual interpreters, as thinkers about the common good. And you also see, by the way, how educated minds can come to different conclusions. Now, that doesn't prevent you from picking uh, the side that you think is stronger. And in this case, I think, in other words, the, the, the majority is correct. There is this broad individual right of self-defense. Now, where do I get that? Uh, uh, here's another part of response that may help. There are three kinds of rights in our rights discourse. Natural rights, civil rights, and political rights. Uh, every human being has natural rights. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Um, uh, every American citizen and people who are here legally and even illegally have certain civil rights like owning property, the right to speak freely, and push, publish your opinions. Political rights tend to be more restricted. Uh, and by the way, of course, we've all but eliminated all restrictions on political rights except age. So, um, but children, for instance, have natural and civil rights, but don't have political rights. Uh, so in some ways, you could say this. The framers clearly thought that the right to defend yourself. Take another right that they saw was central to Republican liberty, the right of conscience, which means not to conscientious objection, but the right to worship God as you choose, or rather worship God. They considered that to be both a natural right, which was preserved fully in civil society. So I think what supports the idea that there's an individual right is the underlying understanding that the right to defend yourself as an individual human being in the state of nature is an absolute and complete right. You retain that right when you come into civil society moderated by the demands of the common good in government. So that's for the primary thing that makes me agree with the majority that there is an individual right underneath it. And that the first part of the clause clumped together into the Second Amendment uh, is, is not the controlling one. It, it still has content, by the way. What it tells you is that it, the states are protected in the forming of their militias. But again, how can it do both, and why does it do both? I think that's what the Tenth Amendment says. Remember, the Tenth Amendment says uh, the powers not delegated to the Congress are reserved to the states or to the people. So I think it can be both a state right to organize a militia, which then also, as the court held in U.S. v. Or v. Miller, it does suggest that, that, and if Dunn were still here, this might be partially an answer to him, that, that it is reasonable to restrict the kinds of weapons and the destructive power of weapons, even though all weapons are destructive, uh, to what the government and the sense of the people see as uh, as consistent with public safety. So, and, and where does the first part of the clause come into then? If it says uh, a, a free, uh, 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 a well-regulated militia be necessary for a free state, then there is the adjectival part says what kind of restrictions can Congress and or the states place on the individual right to bear arms? It could say consistent with our understanding of what a militia arm today would look like. That's why you can say you can't have a bazooka in your home, but you can have a handgun, a rifle, a shotgun, and even certain kinds of what are even called assault weapons. That's within the reasonable power of society to decide what is safe in the common good, and yet what preserves that individual right. Did I answer your question? Sort of. I mean, I, you, you explained it, but what, I'm, what I was specifically asking was, it, it just seems as if the first part of the clause is explaining the rationale for the second part of the clause. And so that to me is more than just in some of these cases, then there is this law. It, it really seems as if the grammatical construction of that that then got, you know, moved around and preserved. It's that there that both of those clauses are important when we're thinking about the entirety of the law, and almost no one mentions the first part. And no one, no one talks about the rationale for their we we have arms because we need to have a militia. Um, well, there. By the way, there you have the great division of the court. Uh, the, the majority in Heller said we have arms because every human being has a right to defend himself in his home. Uh, the majority, the minority said, no, we have arms so that we can form a militia. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that, that's my, my point, though, was kind of like, what is the rack? Like, how can you ignore the first part of the clause was my question. I don't think that, well, that your, the answer to that question depends on whether you agree that the court is ignoring that clause in the majority opinion. Mm. Okay. Um, uh, that does answer my question. They are, they are turning to it. They are giving it interpretive meaning. Um, but they are saying this is not what the core of the clause is. Right. So the great question is, what do you think is the core of the clause? Does that make sense? Yep. 